Our message today, as you can see on the screen, is entitled, The Deadliest Weapon. The Deadliest Weapon. Just going to ask you once again to bow your heads uh, with me as we pray before we have our presentation. I just want to remind you again that at the end of the presentation, please feel free to ask any questions or make any comments. Um, and also, just remember to have a pen and paper at hand so you can write notes, uh, you can uh, write down the scripture references. And also, if you have your Bible, uh, please have them to hand as we're going to be going into the Word of God today. And in particular, we're going to be going to the book of James, James chapter 3. The title of the message, as I said, is The Deadliest Weapon. Let's bow our heads as we pray again. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity that you have given to us, that we can spend some quality time at your feet listening to this powerful message from the book of James. Please bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bible, take it and go with me to James chapter 3. What did I say? I said James chapter 3. Now, James is near the back of the Bible. So if you work your way from, from the back, from Revelation, and move, uh, move to, uh, backwards, you will come to James, small book, James chapter 3. And we're going to be reading, or I'm going to be reading, from verses 1 to 12. 1 to 12 of James chapter 3, and I'm going to read again from the New Living Translation. Now, my favorite translation of the Bible is the King James. That's what I use when I'm studying God's Word, but I also use modern translations, and in particular, I like using the New Living Translation, uh, particularly if the text that I'm reading reads a lot clearer from the modern translation. In this particular passage of scripture, I like how it reads. It's very clear from the New Living Translation, but you can follow in whatever translation you have. So we're looking at James chapter 3 today, verses 1 to 12. This is our main uh, focus today. It says here, James speaking, dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church. For we who teach will be judged more strictly. Indeed, we all make many mistakes. For if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every way. Verse 3, we can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. Verse 6, and among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness. In the King James Version, it says the tongue is a fire, a world of of iniquity, corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. It's talking about the tongue. Verse 7, people can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. 
full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh water and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No. And you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. What is the deadliest weapon? Is it the gun? Is it a nuclear bomb? No, my friends. It's the tongue. In Proverbs 18.21, it says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. What verse, what Bible verse did I say? I said Proverbs 18.21, write it down. It says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. You know, when I read our passage of scripture for today's reading in James, I said to myself, Lord, have mercy on me. When I think about the, the number of times I have said things over the years that I regret. I've spoken in an unfriendly manner. I've spoken aggressively, angrily, and sharply. I've exaggerated, said things that are unkind, and hurtful. I've been abrupt and curt and tactless. I've spoken out of turn and in ways which are sarcastic and condescending and uncaring and unloving. And I've behaved in this way not before becoming a professed baptized Christian, but afterwards. I've come to realize that the fact uh, realize that the act of baptism and calling yourself a Christian does not enable you to control your tongue and behave and speak like Jesus. How much so if you're not a Christian? If being a Christian is difficult, almost impossible to control your tongue, even being a Christian, how much more so if one is not? Going to church does not stop one from using foul language and calling the Lord's name in vain. I've heard professed Christians call God's name in a frivolous way and curse when someone has stepped on their toe. And the Lord only knows what else they might be saying behind closed doors. Jesus, or James rather, says in James verse, in James chapter 3 and verse 10, and so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. And you know, James is talking about professed Christians here, for he says, surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. How can Blessings and praises and curses come from the same mouth. He says, surely, my brothers and sisters, in verse 10 of James chapter 3, surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. You see, my friends, reading your Bible every now and again and having your personal devotion doesn't make you tactful and sensitive and understanding and respectful of every person you meet, regardless of their sex, age, race, background, class, and economic status. You see, there are some people 
including some Christians who speak differently uh, to different uh, people and show uh, some more care and respect than they do for others. But this is evil in the eyes of God. As we learned in my previous message, in James chapter 2 and verse 9, in the Living Translation, it says, but if you favor some people over others, you are committing a sin. You are guilty of breaking the law. In the eyes of God, you see, we are all equal. The Bible says in Galatians 3, 28, for there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. And so you should make the same time and speak the same and have the same level of regard for a person who may be in a lowly position and less educated as you would with a doctor or professor. This is how, my friends, the King of Kings and Lords of Lords, the Creator and the, and the Sustainer of all that is Jesus Christ, related to all mankind when he was on earth. The Bible tells us that God, is no respecter of persons. Or in other words, he shows no favorite, favoritism. But in, ev but in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. In the same way, Jesus relates to us. God relates to us. God expects us to relate to our fellow man. In 1 Peter 2, 21, it says, Christ also suffered, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. The Bible says, let this mind be in you and in me, which was also in Christ Jesus. And in 1 John 2, 6, it says, he that saith he abideth in Jesus, ought himself also to walk, even as he walked. Jesus is our example, not only in terms of how he lived his life, but how he spoke and related to others, all men. Or in other words, those who profess to be Christians should speak as Jesus spoke when he was a man on earth. And the Bible says in Hebrews 4, 15, he, Jesus, was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin and so just like how jesus was tempted to speak out of turn just like how jesus was tempted on occasions to be rude and abrupt and condescending and harsh he did not succumb to the temptation just like how Jesus was tempted and didn't succumb, we too have to learn to guard and control our tongue. And we too, like Christ, can gain the victory today by God's grace and through the power of the Holy Spirit. And how many, and when I consider how many times. I've confessed to the Lord and said sorry to my offender for my words and tone. And then not too long afterwards, some of you know what I'm talking about. And then not long, too long afterwards, lash out with my tongue again. And so all I can say is like the apostle Paul, oh wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me? from the body of this death. I praise uh, God that the Apostle Paul didn't end there when he made this appeal. The Apostle Paul who could relate to what I go through and what many go through. We, we say we are sorry, we confess, and we genuinely want to say the right things all the time and be like Jesus. But then we find ourselves failing, and like Paul, he can identify with this. And that's why he said, oh, wretched man that I am, 
who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And like I said, I thank God that his, his, his appeal didn't end there. He went on to say, Paul that is, in Romans 7, 24, 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus Christ, my friends, is our only solution to the tongue problem. In Philippians 4.13, it says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Even taming my tongue. But first, I have, sur I have to surrender all to Jesus and die daily to self. How about you, my friends? Do you have my weakness? Can you relate to what I am saying? Are you able always to control your tongue? Have you never offended anyone through a poor choice of words? Have you never said an unkind word? Have you never spoken out of turn? Have you never been patronizing? Have you never been rude or abrupt? Have you never lied or exaggerated or understated? Have you never said anything that you wished? Maybe today, even now, you wished that you could just take back. The tongue, as I said, is the deadliest weapon and which none of us has the power to control or to tame. We may think that we can control our tongue and may even have it under wraps for days or even months, but then something happens, something rattles our ego or pride and gets under our skin or we find ourselves in an awkward situation and then that sinful nature of ours raises its ugly head again and from the pit of our stomach and out of our mouth comes deadly poison, the Bible says. And then some of us feel ashamed and guilty. And we fall on our knees and say, oh Lord, have mercy on my soul. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. While others, including some Christians, feel it is no big deal to curse, speak out of turn say offensive and hurtful things and be tactless regardless of the impression it has on others and the negative consequences james calls out these professed christians who believe that what we say is not too bad He says in verse 9 of chapter 3, James chapter 3, he says sometimes, and I know he's talking about Christians here, because he says sometimes they praise our Lord and Father, and sometimes they curse those that have been made in the image of God. Is this us? Is James speaking about you? Do you praise God and with the same lips speak ill of others, gossip and slander people made in the image of God? James says these things ought not so to be. It shouldn't be so among God's people. However, there are some who feel we cannot help what we say. It's just a human trait to shoot off from our mouth every now and again or when we get angry. And so they're not too, too bothered by it. In the dictionary, it says a weapon is a thing designed or used for inflicting bodily harm or physical damage. 
And the Bible makes it clear that the tongue is the deadliest weapon of them all. I want you to know, go to your Bibles. Let's look carefully at what James says in James chapter 3 and verse 6. Again, reading from the New Living Translation, he says, and among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness. In the King James Bible, it says, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. Corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. And so when you read Bible texts like this, we cannot just shrug it off and think it doesn't matter what we say or how we say things. For the Bible makes it clear that if we do not guard or tame our tongue, then it becomes, as the Bible says, a world of iniquity. And what is iniquity? Iniquity is sin. It's another word for sin. And what is the wages of sin? The Bible tells us in Romans 6, 23, that the wages of sin is death. Because the tongue is a little member of the body, because the tongue is a little member of the body, its huge impact or significance can be often overlooked and even be ignored by non-Christians and Christians. You see, no one tends to go to prison for saying something hurtful to another person. Someone who is being verbally abused by their spouse or their children or relatives or so-called friend or colleagues don't normally call the police or seek help as it's perceived as being something less harmful than physical abuse. Whereas verbal abuse, which leads to mental abuse, can have much more devastating consequences. We're talking about that deadliest weapon, the tongue. In Proverbs 12, 18, it says, reading from the New Living Translation, Proverbs 12, 18, write it down, note what it says. It says, some people make cutting remarks, but the words of the wise bring healing. And so words have a tremendous power, either to harm or to scar or to heal. You remember the song we used to sing as kids when we were being verbally abused? Remember that song? Stick and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt. I didn't realize at the time that this, in fact, is the devil's tune. Sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Used to sing it as a child. Didn't know that it was the devil's tune. As it's the complete opposite of what God says in his word about the power of the tongue and the shattering effect, unkind ill-chosen, negative, harsh, unsympathetic, judgmental, and humiliating words can have on a person's mental state and thus affect their ability to function. Physical or mental abuse or verbal abuse is a great evil. God will hold those accountable on the day of judgment. But whereas the physically abused person may be able to rub off their bruises and 
cry out for help. The person being verbally abused is more likely to suffer longer and in silence because they feel it is a weakness on their part to seek help because the abuse is only words. And so the effects of verbal abuse can be more acute, more severe, more detrimental. Even in the church, in all my years, I've never heard a member go to the church board, for example, and complain that another member keep saying things to them to put them down or to humiliate them or, or that somebody spoke to them in a condescending manner to, be, to make them smeal, feel small and worthless. And these things go on, not only in the world, but even in churches. Hence the reason why James is writing to members in the church saying these things ought not to be. These are just seen as little harmless words but the impact of what we say is significant. And the damage caused and the scars left behind can follow a person to their grave. And this is why my favorite writer, James, once again, pulls no punches when he speaks about the devastating nature of the tongue. He says in verse 5 of James chapter 3, and you're reading it with me, he says, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great fire, a great forest on fire. One small spark can cause a huge bushfire resulting in immense destruction and one, just one thoughtless word and selfish statement can destroy a person's confidence, their self-esteem, their comfort and joy and life. Or conversely, as someone said, one second of, rest of restraint can mean avoiding a thousand days of regret. One second of restraint can mean avoiding a thousand days of regret. As I said, words are perceived as small matters. And because words are non-physical, we tend to overlook the impact of our words on others and on ourselves. And we generally tend to forget the importance that God himself places on what we say and how what comes of out of our mouth impacts on us for eternity. As I said, we, we tend to overlook the importance of words, of the things that come out of our mouths and, and the impact it has, not just on others, but the impact it has on us, not just in this life, but according to God's word, the impact it has on us for eternity. Note what the Bible says. I'm going to give you some time to find this passage of scripture. Note what the Bible says in 1 Peter 3 and verse 10. 1 Peter, if you can find James, you can find Peter. If you, if, if you, if you keep on moving along, you'll come to Peter. 1 Peter. Have you got it? Have you got 1 Peter? 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10. 10. I want you to know what the Bible says. doesn't matter what version you have. I'm reading from the, the New Living Translation because uh, it says it so clearly. 
It says here, if you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, talking about eternal life here, if you want to enjoy life, not just now, but for eternity, and see many happy days, keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Powerful passage of scripture. If you want to enjoy life, if you want to live for eternity, if you want to be saved when Jesus comes, if there is a heaven and you want to make sure that you can enter in, the Bible says, keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. You see, my friends, many people, including a lot of so-called Christians, are not going to make it to heaven, not because they didn't get baptized and go to church and play an active part. The reason they are not going to make it through those pearly gates is not because they, they didn't study their Bible enough and pray every morning and every night. The reason a lot of people are not going to make it into glory is not because they didn't eat healthily or give to charity or witness for their faith. Oh, my friends, the reason a lot of people and a lot of Christians are not going to make it to the promised land is not because they physically killed anyone, but because they killed people throughout their life with their tongue, their unseasoned words, gossip and slander, and didn't care enough to acknowledge their deadly weapon was out of control and seek divine help. I said a lot of people are not going to make it. Not because they didn't keep to the letter of the law all of the Ten Commandments. Not because they, they, they didn't go to church each week. Not because they, they didn't, uh, 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 not because they, 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 they killed or, or harmed someone. The reason why a lot of them a lot of people, and I pray to God, I'm not included in this by his grace. It's because they kill people with their tongue. And they because, not only because they killed people in the past with their tongue, but they didn't recognize that their tongue was out of control and get divine help to tame it. Too many people and professed Christians see the tongue, what they say and how they come across and the effects their words have on people as a small matter, as I said. But it's not so in the eyes of God. He says, if you want to enjoy life, and see many happy days. Keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. That is all kinds of lies. The little white lies, the exaggerations, and understatements. In James 1, 26, it says, if you claim, James again, in an earlier chapter, James chapter 1, Note what the Bible says. You're, you found James. You found James chapter 3. You can find James chapter 1. In James chapter 1, 26, write it down. Note what it says. James says, if you claim to be religious, but don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourselves and your religion is worthless. I want you to think about that. You see, that's why I like James. He says it so clearly, so plainly, that we cannot be mistaken. He says, if you claim to be religious, but don't control your tongue, if you can't tame your tongue, you are fooling yourselves and your religion is worthless. Think about it. 
If you cannot control your tongue, then all the other religious stuff you are doing is worthless. If you cannot stop saying harsh and hurtful things to people when it, when it comes to your self salvation, all the other stuff you are doing is meaningless. If you cannot stop telling little white lies, if you cannot stop talking about people, then all the other stuff you are doing and all the religious acts that you are performing are worthless. Going to church is not going to get you anywhere if you cannot bridle or control your tongue according to the Bible. But tongue is not something we, we tend to focus on much, you know this, or talk or preach about. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if people hardly ever prayed about their tongue and asked God to give them complete control over it so that their speech uh, will be always with grace. Not sometimes, but always with grace, seasoned with salt, that they may know what he ought to answer every man. Colossians 4 and verse 6. But rather than being an afterthought, or the last thing we pray for, having control over our tongue should be the first thing we ask God for. At night when we go to bed, and the first thing we ask God for when we wake up. Because note what the Bible says in verse 2, of James 3. Go back there. Very important that we don't miss what the Bible says, says here. James chapter 3 and verse 2, it says, if we could control our tongues, we would be what? Perfect and could also control ourselves, this is really important, in every other way. In the King James Version, it says, if any a man offend not in word, or in other words, if he controls his tongue, the same is a perfect man. You've read it. And able also to bridle or control the whole of his or her body. Isn't that amazing? And so God's word says two important things. Two important things. Did you know it? Two important things that we must not miss. One, he says, if we can manage to control our tongue, we can control ourselves in every other way. Or if we gain victory over the most powerful weapon in our body, the tongue, then we can gain victory over every sin in our life which, so, which so, does so easily beset us. And secondly, God's word says, if we can control the tongue, then we are perfect in God's sight. And in Matthew 5, 48, Jesus says, we must be perfect even as our Father, which in heaven is perfect. Oh, my friends, if we can control the tongue, then we can control every other part of our body. If we can control the tongue, we can gain victory over every besetting sin in our lives. If we can control the tongue, we can gain victory in Christ Jesus. And so what should we be praying for? Day and night that God will give us victory, power over the tongue so that we may speak as he speaks, so that we may think as he thinks, so that we may act in all situations we find ourselves as he would act. And not only that we may say the right words, that we may say the words in the right tone. When I look at myself in the mirror and I see my flaws 
and how difficult I find it to bridle my tongue. I wonder, I often wonder, is it even possible? And who then shall be saved? But then I remember the words of Christ in Luke 18, 27. And he said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, write it down. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. God is able to give us the victory over our tongue. But what did I say we've got to do? First, we've got to surrender all to Jesus. And then we've got to die daily to self. What did I say? I said, first, we've got to surrender all to Jesus. And then we've got to die daily to self, which then allows God's grace to come upon us and his Holy Spirit to move within us. And so that our words then become his words, well-seasoned, tactful, Loving, kind, gentle, firm, but loving. Whatever temptation or weakness we may have, when it comes to controlling our tongue, the good news is that God can give you and he can give me the victory today. If we acknowledge our sin and weakness and ask God to come into our hearts through the Holy Spirit and transform us. God has also, as I come to the end, given us tips in his word on how we can control our tongue. One tip is found in Proverbs 15 and verse 28. Write it down. One tip on how we can control our tongue. In Proverbs 8, 15, 28, again, reading from the New Living Translation, it says, the heart of the godly thinks carefully before speaking. The mouth of the wicked overflows with evil words. It says, the heart of the godly thinks carefully before speaking. The Bible says we should think carefully before we speak. In the world, they have taken this divine counsel and said we should count to how much? We should count to 10 before we speak. And it's very important that we think carefully, not only about what we are going to say, as I've said before, but how we are going to say it and how we are going to come across. This is really important. And James, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, comes back again with another tip, some more solid counsel in James 1, 19, James 1, 19, you're already in James, you can find it. James 1, 19, he says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to do what? To hear. Swift to hear. And slow to do what? To speak. Slow to wrath. The deadliest weapon is indeed the tongue. And with this in mind, as I close, I want us to just ponder on the solemn and relevant words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who said in, in Matthew chapter 12, 
36 and 37. I'll give you some time to find our, our final passage of scripture. It's Matthew. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The first book in the New Testament, Matthew. Matthew chapter 12. I'll give you some time to find it. As we close off on this the solemn and relevant words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Matthew 12, 36 and 37, Jesus says, But I say unto you, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified. By thy words thou shalt be condemned. Let us bow our heads. Dear